This is episode 29 of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. We're on a mission from God. It's back to film history class today as we travel east to look at the third largest movie industry in the world. It's a cinematic culture which produced one of my favorite film directors, Wong Kar Wai, and that is the Hong Kong cinema. Our guide into this cinematic world has written numerous books on the larger Asian film industry, and he teaches it at Lancaster University in the UK. He's been with us before. His name is Dr. Gary Bettinson. This is going to be a longer than normal episode, so let's get right into it. What I didn't realize was that Hong Kong cinema is the third largest movie industry in the world behind Hollywood and uh, India. Hollywood, yeah. yeah, we know we know so little about it. I think most Westerners don't even realize that Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee belong to this movement. Really? You're right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't realize it until I, I started investigating it. Hmm. Um, well, yeah, they both came up in the 1970s. Um, you know, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee was a child actor, and then he achieved, you know, he's quite well known in Hong Kong as a child actor. And then you know, he went to Hollywood for a few years in the 60s and was in the uh, his TV te- television show called The Green Hornet, um, playing Kato. But he didn't really manage to break through internationally until he went back to Hong Kong in 1970 and uh, launched his career as an adult actor, martial arts star. And that's that began the Bruce Lee kind of kung fu craze around the world. And then after he died, there were a lot of imitators. Um, there was what they called the Bruce exploitation <laughs> genre, yeah. so an exploitation genre really of Bruce Lee imitators. With name, you know, actors with names like Bruce Lai and Bruce Lone and Bruce Lowe, and you know, total ripoffs of the real thing. And Jackie Chan kind of grew out of that in a sense. He was he he was being positioned as a you know the next Bruce Lee, um, and it didn't really work for him until he decided to take a comedic approach to the genre, you know, and become a basically a kung fu comedy star. And yeah. that's when he he had you know by departing from what Bruce Lee did, that's when Jackie Chan managed to make himself you know distinct and unique really as a Hong Kong action star. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised at how um, how much the Hong Kong cinema seems so much like American cinema. Mm. Is there is there a big influence there? There is, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting in different periods you look at. I suppose it's because you could argue that it's become more and more Hollywoodized. You know, as, as, uh, as time's gone gone by, and it's trying really since the nineteen ninety seven handover. Um, since the late 90s, trying to emulate and to some extent compete with Hollywood productions. Um, you know, so it's, a, a, it's assimilating CGI technology, trying to tell stories in the manner of a Hong Kong, uh, sorry, of a Hollywood, you know, style script. Um, but that, the influence has always been there. I mean, Hong Kong is a very westernized place. You know, obviously it was a British colony for a long time. And um, the Hong Kong filmmakers are very much aware of, of Hollywood cinema. And, uh, and a lot of them in the 1990s were courted by Hollywood and moved there, you know, and tried to launch careers in Hollywood or to be, develop their careers there. Right. People like John Woo, um, Choi Hart, um, and also actors like Jackie Chan and Michelle Yeoh, Chow Yun Fat, Jet Li. You know, that, the, the 90s was the, the decade really when uh, Hong, Hollywood really began to look to Hong Kong for inspiration. Right. Uh, so you get martial arts style, you know, Hong Kong style action in films like The Matrix, and that starts to take off in American movies. And they, they, the makers of uh, the Matrix recruit um, Yun Wu Ping, who was the, uh, who was a very well-renowned Hong Kong martial arts choreographer, huh. to devise the action sequences in in the Matrix. You know. Okay, I didn't know that. The, yeah, the influence is reciprocal. So definitely, Hong Kong filmmakers are inspired and influenced by Hollywood, but it moves in cultural influence moves in the other direction too. Huh. 
Yeah. Interesting. So, um, yeah, that is the remake of, you know, Infernal Affairs as The Departed and make, making an Oscar winning Hollywood movie out of a, what many thought of at the time as a, as a Hong Kong pot boiler, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, it was a very riveting film and uh, they had some really good actors mm. uh, playing in that film. Um, this might be a difficult question, so I don't really know what I'm asking. So if I'm asking you something that's too much, just <laughs> let me know. But can you boil, can, can you give me uh, a, a brief overview of Hong Kong cinema in a nutshell? Right. <laughs> um, well, I, I suppose this sort of historical sketch would be... Uh, you know, it's, it's always been associated with action genres. And I guess you could break that down into the swordplay film, which is called the Wu Sha Pian. Uh, Wu means martial, Sha means martial shiv uh, uh, chivalry, uh, chivalry hero, so the film of martial chivalry. So you've got the swordplay genre, the kung fu genre, which is a sort of Bruce Lee film. The gunplay films, or sometimes they're called heroic uh, bloodshed movies sort of John Woo um, crime thrillers um, so those genres have been around for a while um, the 1960s there was a big major Hong Kong film studio called Shaw Brothers and they specialised really in swordplay films or Wu Sha films a very stylized action uh, movies and that studio modelled itself on the classical Hollywood studios of, you know, the 1930s and 40s. Um, the, the, the genre shifted into Kung Fu with Bruce Lee in the 1970s. And in the late 70s, there was a turn toward comedy, especially Kung Fu comedy. So that's when Jackie Chan emerges. And in the 1980s, they tried to modernize those genres because a lot of those earlier films, the Wuxia films and the, the traditional Kung Fu movies were set in the historical past. You know, sometimes in one of China's ancient dynasties. So in the 80s, they tried to upgrade, and to a certain extent, Hollywoodize Hong Kong cinema, uh, update, modernize the old-fashioned genres. And that's when John Woo comes along with his urban-based, modern-day set gunplay films. Um, and then that's in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, really 86 to 1993, that's considered... Um, Hong Kong's last golden era. So there were a few years there where Hong Kong cinema was, you know, the kind of production boom, new talent emerged, uh, the films were becoming internationally uh, popular and recognised. Um, and around 1993, then the industry tipped into decline for various reasons. Um, the 1997 handover from Britain back to mainland China, so Hong Kong was returned to chi mainland Chinese sovereignty. Uh, that brought some new developments, so a closer relationship between Hong Kong and mainland Chinese cinema. And since then, since then really, um, Hong Kong cinema has stabilized, but it's much less productive than it used to be. So in its heyday, it was making about 300 films a year. Now it makes about 50, between 50 and 60. And most of those films today are co-productions between Hong Kong and mainland China, uh, which means that Hong Kong films are now subject, subjected to uh, mainland Chinese censorship, and that brings its own cluster of problem, problems. Huh. I mean, that's a very broad historical sketch. Um, yeah. But those genres have survived. You know, the action genres are still probably what uh, Hong Kong cinema is best known for internationally. But it, it's more interesting than that. It's more diverse than that, actually. The, the type of film that it makes, you know, it makes low-key low personal dramas. It makes comedies. Um, you know, there are socially conscious films. There are political films, roman romantic comedies. I mean, it, it, it's generically diverse, but it's really the action movies that seem to travel well, I guess, for fairly self-evident reasons. Right. Know, language problems of communication, you know, translation across cultures. The films are rooted in visual spectacle. Um, those sort of action genres tend to travel well anyway, doesn't it? How can we access these? Do, are they 
coming through mainstream um, distribution channels in in the West, or do, where do you find these films? Um, well, a lot of them were given DVD releases. So in um, Britain, there was a label called Hong Kong Legends DVD label, and that was uh, that was going for a few years, and they remastered the films. They added a lot of bonus features, you know, DVD documentaries and behind the scenes and uh, contemporary interviews. In America, North America, there was a label called Dragon Dynasty um, DVD label, and they released, uh, I'm not sure how many, possibly, possibly 30 or so, around there, I think, um, titles. Again, sort of, they put a lot of care and um, into into packaging these films, so they they released them over. You know, they didn't rush the releases out, and they selected titles. But that was primarily they were primarily action movies that were being released, and that was connected with the Weinstein Company, um, which was distributing a lot of Hong Kong films in North America at that time. Um, other than that, so since since those labels have kind of uh, kind of come to an end. Um, you know, some of the films are available online. Um, a lot of them are available on DVD, but they, you know, they might not be. Um, I don't. I don't know of any. I'm just sorry. I'm just trying to think. There's a. I think there's a label called Cine Cine Asia, which is another DVD label, but um, you yeah, know, ded dedicated to. To Hong Kong and Asian action cinema. Um, some of the films get theatrical releases, but usually only li very limited. So there yeah. were there were a few uh, waves, new waves that came through the, mm. the cinema of China. Can you can you briefly talk about those? Yeah, that's right. In the late 1970s, there was what was called the first new wave of Hong Kong filmmakers. They came out primarily uh, of television and. Uh, some of them had had a university education. Some of some of them were educated in the West. Uh, directors like Anne Hoy, who's still working today, and uh, Choi Hark, who is also still working today, although he's mainly based in Beijing now. So he's very much a mainlandized Hong Kong filmmaker. You know, he's making mainland Chinese films, really blockbuster movies. They're both very important directors still still to this day. But they initially were sort of socially conscious filmmakers, a lot of the first new wave directors. Um, some of them moved into high concept Hollywood style productions. So Choi Hart, for instance, is often described as the next, the, sorry, the Hong Kong George Lucas or the Hong Kong Steven Spielberg. You know. um, and that gives you an idea of the kinds of films that he was drawn to making. Um, then in the mid 1980s, there was a second new wave, and that included filmmakers like Wong Kar Wai, uh, Stanley Kwan, who directed a well-known film called Rouge, a sort of much-beloved Hong Kong movie. Yeah. And he's made a num number of films. They're, they're all still active in the Hong Kong film industry and the chi mainland Chinese film industry today. Uh, and then there are directors like John Wu, who aren't usually assimilated to either of the two waves um, because... He, uh, John Woo's breakthrough film is called The Better Tomorrow, and it was released in 1986. So it that, the release of that film coincided roughly with the emergence of the second wave directors. Um, but he'd already been around the industry for quite a few years by that point, so he wasn't considered a new director. You know, he wasn't new to the industry. But his breakthrough film arrived too late to be considered part of the first new wave. So. There are filmmakers who don't sit easily in any of the, of the so-called waves of filmmakers. Um, but he came through at that time as well. And, you know, a lot of critics, critics bemoan the fact that the, the current Hong Kong film industry is still very much reliant on the directors from the first and second new waves. You know, they're still, they're veterans now, but they're still carrying the film industry in terms of commercial success. They're the ones making the big blockbuster movies. There have yeah. been a few others that have emerged in the 90s and 2000s, but it's those older directors. It's like I suppose it's like Spielberg and Lucas. You know, they're still yeah. and Scorsese in America. They're they're still important. They're still vital filmmakers 
um, but commercially very important for the Hong Kong film industry. Right. Um, a lot of them, uh, well, maybe not a lot of them. How, how many of these directors uh, have made the crossover like John Woo and uh, Wong Kar Wai into the Hollywood space? Yeah, that's a good question. Quite a number of them did go to America in the 1990s. Uh, there's a director called Peter Chang, uh, Choi Hark, I mentioned, uh, made a, a Jean-Claude Van Damme film. A few of them did that. <laughs> Uh, started out, I think John Woo's first film was Hard Target, which was a John called Van Damme vehicle. You know, I think John Woo, I think it's pretty indisputable that he was the most successful Hong Kong filmmaker um, in, in terms of the, you know, adapting to the Hollywood system. A lot of them struggled to adapt. Uh, they didn't find the kind of artistic freedom that they were used to in Hong Kong, um, in, in America. And there was far more bureaucracy there in America than they were used to back home. Uh, so uh, quite a number of Hong Kong directors have tried their hand at American filmmaking, but most of them returned to Hong Kong or mainland China uh, soon after. Even Wong Kar Wai, you know, he made a film called My Blueberry Nights in 2007. Yeah. And... Um, it's an interesting film, but it wasn't. It was not successful, and uh, he hasn't made an American film since. He, he basically turned to Asia after that. Uh, and even John Woo, John Woo is back in China. He left Hollywood a few years ago. He had, oh, really? Yeah, he had a run of pretty successful films there. In the in the nineties, after Hard Target, he made a film called Broken Arrow, uh, which was John Travolta and Christian Slater, which was an action movie, which was reasonably successful i mean i think it did well at the box office but then after that he makes face off which is critically and commercially um you know quite very very successful uh and after that on, on the back of that success he gets given a mission impossible movie so he makes uh, the, the first sequel to mission impossible with tom cruise okay That's probably the apex of his success as a commercial filmmaker in Hollywood. After that, he made a Ben Affleck movie called Paycheck, which some critics said was the title was, you know, the reason he made the film. Uh, it was not a, um, not a not a success commercially or critically. I think he made a film called Wind Talkers, which was a Nicolas Cage war movie. And then he just seemed to lose his authorial kind of signature in a way. He, he, he seemed to lose his way in Hollywood. Um, I think a lot of those foreign directors do when they come to Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. They lose their voice when they have to fit into that system. Seem to, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I've spoken to a few Hong Kong film directors who have worked in America, and they say there's just, the, yeah, there's just too much, there's too much interference by too many people. There are too many test screenings, and too many memos, too many suggestions by executives. Everyone has to give notes because you can't not give notes you know, on a screening. So then you have, the filmmakers have to make adjustments and uh, it doesn't work like that in Hong Kong. You know, there's far less studio interference and the filmmakers have a great deal more artistic freedom. Yeah. Um, they work a lot faster in Hong Kong as well. And I think the, the there's a sort of laborious quality to, Hong, to Hollywood film production that Hong Kong filmmakers don't adapt well to. You know, all of the pre-production phase yeah. Really expensive. In Hong in Hong Kong cinema, in the old days there was no pre production phase really. I mean very, very limited. So they they would make the films without the screenplay, for instance. And so you could eliminate you didn't need to produce a pre production screenplay, you could elim eliminate a great part of the pre production phase because you didn't have to redraft the script, you know, in Hollywood. You know, okay, so that's that's fascinating because I, I know Wong Kar Wai does that quite a bit. Uh, and yeah. I thought it was just unique to him, but it's not unique to him. It's it's, no, it's particular to that cinema. Exactly. Yeah, he's grown out of that industry, so it's, it's how they it doesn't know any different really. It's how they learn. It's how they make films. So whereas in Hollywood, obviously a pre-production screenplay usually goes through various iterations, and there are a number of different screenwriters and you know script doctors and so on. Right. And, uh, and that can take months, often years, uh, as you know. Yeah. In, in Hollywood, sorry, in Hong Kong, they won't have a script. They'll have 
maybe a page long synopsis. They have to produce that to finance, to finance, finance you, you know, to see what the film is going to be about. But it won't contain dialogue. It won't. It will be devoid of scene breakdowns. It will just be literally a broad outline of the story. And that's not iron, ironclad either. So once they begin shooting, they can pretty much digress from the story if they choose. Um, okay. Yeah. So they begin shooting without a screenplay. They record. They shoot the films without sound. So they don't need to have written any dialogue, you know, because all of the dialogue, all the whole soundtrack, will be dubbed in in post production. Okay, so they're they're post syncing all their sound. Exactly. They don't do that anymore. But this was in the up to the late 1990s. They were doing this. So when John Woo was, you know, making his breakthrough Hong Kong films, Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, they, they were all of those films were dubbed. Very often, the, the actors' voices were dubbed by other people, so audiences didn't actually hear Jackie Chan's real voice. And, you know, for years, he, he had a voice double. Um, but the point is that because the because the dialogue could be dubbed in in post production, you didn't need a you didn't need a script, you didn't need scripted dialogue. Right. The directors would just instruct their actors on the set to recite numbers. You know, as long as their lips were moving. <laughs> Didn't matter. Right. Then you could dub the dialogue in afterwards. Uh-huh. Um, there are various reasons why they did dub sound, but that that was the, the standard practice at the time. Um, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's yeah. something we wouldn't know as Westerners because we we wouldn't know that they're not speaking. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's, it's partly part of the cult appeal of Hong Kong films in the eighties and nineties was that mismatch of you know on-screen lip movements with the dialogue on the soundtrack. That audiences, cult audiences in the West, really embrace that because you know, it, it looks kind of not. It's not very slick. It's not. T- t- it's sort of technically crude and technically primitive. It looks so different from American films and English films and you know European films uh, that it becomes a kind of appeal, a perverse appeal. That and the shoddy subtitling that attended some of the films uh, when they were released in in uh, in the West. Yeah, but you can see why Hong, Hong Kong filmmakers would struggle to adapt to the Hollywood production system because yeah. just, you know there's no no comparison, right? No which it, which is exciting to me because you know it, it's true that the Hollywood system is so laborious and so ponderous uh, to see another culture adapt or creating a, a form of cinema that doesn't rely on the same kind of conventions that Hollywood does in terms of production is. To me, fascinating. Yeah, I think you can feel the energy in the films because they were shot fast. You know, some of the films would would be made in week, you know, a week, week or two, if not, if not days. You know, from um, pre-production to post-production, they, and the, the energy is there. The, the kineticism is there in the films themselves. I think, and Hong, recent Hong Kong films have lost that a bit because, as they've started to emulate Hollywood movies, they've also um, adopted some of Hollywood's production practices and craft routines, you know, work, working methods. And so they are taking longer to make films. Uh, they are more concerned with, they do write scripts now before shooting. They are more concerned with um, kind of a certain technical sophistication. That, and so I think as a result, a lot of the energy is, is sort of seeped out of Hong Kong films and a lot of the cultural distinctiveness too. And I think that's unfortunate but probably inevitable, you know. Yeah, I remember reading uh, Wong Kar Wai talk about uh, making uh, In the Mood for Love. And at the same time, he was also shooting 2046. uh, And he talks about how one evolved into the other. It was started out as three stories for his film. And then uh, the Mood for Love one sort of branched off and became its own film while they were shooting it. And it took them eight months, apparently, to shoot In the Mood for Love and then edit it all down and whatever. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I'm really fascinated by that process to see, wow, this guy he spent eight months doing this and it turned out to be this beautiful film. Oh, it's sublime, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I call that um, process post-production plotting. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> In a sense, they don't. They've got a rough idea of the story, but Wong Kar Wai is a great example because there are so many different versions of the finished film. You know, uh, there are so many. Sometimes he'll cut entire subplots, major stars from his films. It could the film could have been so different, 
um, than it ends up being. But the pop really coalesces, it crystallizes in post-production editing and they take a long time in editing to work out what the story will be. But it does mean that there are some casualties. A lot of you know, major stars in Hong Kong have ended up on the cutting room floor and they've had yeah. big roles, you know, shot, shot all of this material. It does surface. Um, DVD releases and some films he goes back to and releases alternative cuts of. Um, so I think there are three, at least three versions of the Grandmaster floating around. Yeah. And he revisited his martial arts, uh, Wu Sha Pian, you know, swordplay film, Ashes of Time, uh, in uh, about 14 years after, I think, its original release. It's called Ashes of Time Redux, and uh, that exists. The Redux is a re-edited version of the original film because he has so much footage. Right. So and that's variations of the story because there, there is no firm story until they kind of discover it in editing. He and his uh, editor, William Chang, have uh, been long time collaborators. Huh. Yeah, I remember him saying that um, he was being criticized for the amount of footage he was shooting and that um, in the mood for love had like a 30 to one ratio of, <laughs> of film that he shot and he, and people were complaining about it. And he right. made the comment, he said, well, that's normal in Hollywood now that Hollywood shooting 200 to one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. But it, and it's really atypical of Hong Kong. That's why a lot of critics don't really regard him as a Hong Kong filmmaker because ah. he's a special case. He gets special privileges. You know, Hong Kong filmmakers don't shoot that much footage. The, the ratio isn't that high. They don't, um, you know, they, they, he's, he produced, he has his own production company called Jet Tone and he can take his time. He has a, he has a different, his films reach a different audience than most Hong Kong filmmakers as well. Yeah. You know, um, and he's a big guy. I've seen him on uh, next to pe okay. people. I'm, you usually think of the Chinese as being small yeah. people, but he dwarfs the, the Americans. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what he's uh, what he was weaned on, but uh, he'd be a good basketball player, I think. One call. <laughs> <laughs> or linebacker. <laughs> yeah. But he's such an enigmatic figure. You know, he has these trademark sunglasses when he's interviewed he's usually quite cryptic and enigmatic he doesn't like to tell the, the the audience what his films are about really or really how he makes them you know he, he drops little breadcrumbs but he's a, he's kept a mystique and uh he in a lot of ways he's not a typical hong kong filmmaker he's not as accessible as most hong kong filmmakers are um and he doesn't work as much you know it takes him a long time to make a film he hasn't made a feature-length film since The Grandmaster, which was 2013. And that's not unusual, you know. That's a uh, shame. But you were saying about 2046 and In the Move for Love, and they're an interesting, they're interesting bedfellows, aren't they? Because it's, 2046 is ostensibly a sequel to In the Move for Love. You know, Tony Leung seems to be playing the same character. He has the same name. Um, but in, in there's this 1960s setting. On the other hand, though, it's, it doesn't seem like a really coherent fit. And I think Wong Kar Wai has talked about it not being a direct sequel. So yeah. it's interesting how the films fit together. You know, he's, there's a, they used to talk about his 1960s trilogy. Because there was a film he made called Days of Being Wild, which was really, right. which is 1990. And that was a film that introduced him as an auteur filmmaker, you know, with a distinctive signature of his own. And that's set in uh, the 1960s as well. And Tony Leung makes an appearance right at the very end of the film. And a lot of critics, and Wong, Wong himself has hinted that that character is actually Chow, the character that we later meet in, in The Need for Love. So these various films kind of fit together in a loose, you know, uh, sort of loose pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. They don't quite fit neatly together, but yeah. there's a suggestion of an interconnected universe so that all of his films kind of um, kind of cohere around some, you know, some imagined fictional world. Yeah. I th there are a few films that, that I, when I first see them, they just arrest me and I have to watch them again and again. And In the Mood for Love was one of those. Right. Um, just Did because you see it when it was released. I'm sorry. Did you see it when it was released? No, I didn't. Uh, I'd never even heard about it, right. and I was, you know, I was looking for some of the Chinese films just to look at their 
uh, cinematic qualities. And this is, was one that always kept appearing in some of the searches I would do. And uh, I just found it on Criterion Channel and, and played it. And I was just stunned at how how much of a command he has of his craft where he has every element of cinematic storytelling at work in this film. And the film is really nonverbal. That's what struck me is that everything that's being spoken is not the story. The story is in all of the nonverbal cues, the way it's shot, the colors, the framing, the, the, the close compositions. Uh, and it just struck me as this is a guy who has a master of the cinematic craft. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You're right, there's that the nonverbal element too, I think. Uh, I mean, my feeling is that in that film in particular, but also some of his other films too, the characters are not inclined to express their emotions. You know, yeah. they're kind of repressed or you know, reticent to be emotionally expressive. And sometimes the social mores of the culture doesn't allow, you know, doesn't invite social, uh, doesn't invite emotional frankness. So Wong Kar Wai kind of displaces the character's emotions onto items of the setting. So there are a lot of insert shots and cutaways of, you know, rain falling on the pavement or yeah. smoke, you know, the curlicues of smoke rising from a cigarette. Yeah. Um, and it's like those shots are not just they're not just um, decorative, you know, they're suggestive right. of the characters that sub subdue passions that can't find relief. And I think that's so it's visual, it's visual and it's very musical as well. Yeah. Um, and you're right, it's extremely cinematic. I think that's film, sort of, yeah, so go ahead. That sequence of him going down the stairs and her coming up the stairs with that musical mm -hmm. moment, I, that was just the, the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, how he was able to tell a story so lyrically just with those movements and the music. Yeah, absolutely. But, but that that sequence is repeated. I mean, not in the same exactly the same way, but variations yeah. of that because the characters are kind of um, creatures of habit. You know, they they are stuck in the same routine. Yeah, and that's typical of Wong Kar Wai's characters that they usually are part of their timidness. Um, is that they are kind of allergic to change. Right? They're, they're kind of, they, they find comfort in routine and, yeah. and ritual, and they have to learn over the course of the plot to not only accept but embrace change. And when they do that, then they can sort of find happiness or the prospect of happiness. But until okay. then, they're kind of stagnating. I think that's, in the mood for love, kind of dramatizes that as well but yeah it does that, that yeah. film I think is his most internationally uh, acclaimed now you know I mean before that he had Chunking Express which you know Quentin Tarantino championed and released in America under his yeah. own DVD label but the style the style that you're describing of In the Mood for Love really was a at the time it felt like a radical departure for Wong Kar Wai because in, in the mood for love, it's a, almost a classical style, very stately, you know, very precise camera work. And, uh, yeah, it's, a, a, it's completely different than Chunking Express. Absolutely, yeah. It's more sedate. It's, the camera movement's kind of languid. Before it was all erratic handheld camera work and smudge motion or, you know, step printing and MTV style. Uh, yeah. history, and that's what he was known for. And, in the mood for love came along, and it just, it just. I think it took a lot of critics by by surprise. You could say yeah. that Happy Together, which was the film he made just before that, yeah, well, it's three years before, but it was you know, his most recent film up there. I so wonder that, how much it. Well. Sorry. Yeah, so as you can say, Happy Together, the style of that kind of suggests or anticipates uh, in the mood for love style, yeah. but at the same time, it still has that propulsive energy of Chunking Express and Fallen Angels and. The other films, he, other films he made in the nineties. I wonder how much his cinematographer had in influencing how that one was shot. Uh, Mark Lee Ping Bing. Mm -hmm. um, I watched the doc documentary by him I, on him, and it was fascinating documentary. Oh, well, he's, I think there were two two cinematographers on In the Mood for Love. Um, yeah. Christopher Doyle was the other one. Yeah, and Christopher Doyle was was, was had worked with Wong Kar Wai 
on several films through the 90s, including Chunking Express, and together they kind of received credits for Wong Kar Wai's visual style. Uh, I think they had a parting of ways um, after In the Mood for Love in 2046, so I don't think they've worked together since then. And yet, Wong Kar Wai's visual style is still identifiable, you know, and he's still very much in evidence in his more recent yeah. films. Yeah, so for sure. I'm, sure, I'm sure Chris Doyle in particular had a big influence in establishing Wong Kar Wai's visual aesthetic. And I think Wong Kar Wai has carried it forward with other collaborators. Yeah. Yeah, since they parted ways. Um, Terrence Malick, he, he strikes me very much in the same vein as Wong Kar Wai in how he shoots. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you know a whole lot about him. A little bit, yeah. Um, because he generally doesn't write much of a script, or if he does, it's sort of vague, and then he just goes out and shoots uh, spontaneously and then assembles things later in the edit. Right, yeah. I so think, to me, he's he's the most uh, yeah. Chinese Hong Kong-style <laughs> cinema, cinema uh, practitioner yeah. uh, of all the American filmmakers. Yeah, I don't think there's so much money involved in Hollywood productions. I don't think any investors would allow the Hong Kong working methods to be, you know, permitted. Uh, you know, it's too much at stake, really. Uh, and there are custom, customary ways of, of making films in Hollywood of, by this day. But uh, it's interesting, though. I mean, I think around that, around the time, of, there, I remember there was talk. Of, in relation to Wong Kar Wai and Terence Malick and, and directors like um, Sophia Coppola as well, sort of around the early 2000s, um, late 90s, early 2000s. So. Uh. Lost in Translation, I think, uh, Sophia Coppola's film. Right. There's films that start to, in America as well as in, in Europe and other parts of Asia, that, that start to adopt the Wong Kar Wai you know, aesthetic, the look and feel of his film. And, and, try to start to absorb some of that influence and that's when you know i think it was very often in the mood for love or around that time in particular when uh when you can see you can see that he's had his films are having an impact on the uh work of other auteurs and then of course scorsese um you know filmmakers like scorsese start to look to hong kong films for for models you know yeah films to remake or films to emulate Right. Um, the Chinese film, um, The Wandering Earth. Oh, mm. that yeah. science fiction film that made uh, like six hundred million dollars in such a short period of time uh, in China. Um, did you? Did were you able to see that? It's on Netflix here. Yeah, Netflix <laughs> bought it. You have it, yeah. Yeah, I saw it. It's um, it's a, it's. Slightly unusual because uh, mainland China doesn't have a tradition of science fiction filmmaking, but it's made a couple of science fiction movies in the last year. I think there's one one coming up soon. Um, it's not a Hong Kong film. It's not a Hong Kong China co-production. Okay. Uh, but on the other hand, it's it's not uh, it's not unlike the kinds of films that Hong Kong filmmakers some of them are making now because when they do work with China like I say most Hong Kong films are China co-production today um, they, they are making big budget high concept blockbuster movies um, and uh, they weren't really doing that in Hong Kong so that's, that's the way the industry has shifted as, as Hong Kong and mainland China film industries have become more in imbricated and more interlinked um, okay. so a tendency to, to all big blockbuster productions, which are considered to be more mainland Chinese. So they talk about Hong Kong cinema being mainlandized, you know, making. Oh, okay. But they also talk about it being Hollywoodized, and really the difference between those two pressures or in, you know, me, um, two forces isn't that great. They're both both very you know variants of uh, high concept blockbuster spectacular filmmaking um, uh. so one Hong Kong filmmaker I spoke to who worked in America in the 90s briefly said that the best 
preparation for working in mainland China was working in Hollywood because, you know, there's a lot of bureaucracy in mainland China. There's a, the censorship system is, is uh, really uh, onerous and convoluted. Uh. Whereas in Hong Kong, there wasn't much. There was some censorship, but they had a rating system. They still have it in, in Hong Kong. So they could make films for, you know, of all different, for all different uh, age groups and demographics. Whereas in mainland China, there's no rating system. There's just blanket censorship. So a film has to be suitable for all audiences, you know, viewer, viewer of any age. Um, and the criteria are kind of eccentric, uh, bizarre. So they, so there are certain things banned from mainland Chinese films that are pretty commonplace in Hong Kong cinema. So you, for example, you can't have ghosts in a film if that's released in mainland China. So you can't make a ghost film. Whereas mm. Hong Kong has a, has a history, a tradition of supernatural uh, thrillers and, and ghost comedies. Um, right. You can be no unhappy endings and no immoral endings. Uh, you can't criticize figures of authority like policemen or teachers or doctors or politicians. You know, they can't be shown to be corrupt right. or immoral or incompetent. So the, the genres that Hong Kong cinema was known for and really specialized in, um, they're not really permitted in mainland China. Huh. And that's a problem if Hong Kong filmmakers are working more and more with China because it means that they're old their traditional genres are in are endangered. That's at least a lot of what of what a lot of critics fear. Um, oh. You know, you can't have too much. Can't have graphic sex. You can't have graphic violence. And so, those action genres of heroic bloodshed and wuxia and kung fu, which are usually quite violent in Hong Kong, yeah, um, you know, they really have to be tempered and toned down in mainland China. So. Oh. Uh, that's a fear. A lot of critics fear that Hong Kong cinema is disappearing, is dying. Some critics say it's already dead, you know, that we're in an era of post-Hong Kong cinema. Oh. Hong Kong films are really mainland Chinese films, um, you know, subject to the draconian censorship system that the Beijing authorities have put in place. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Having oh. said that, I mean, I don't... That's a... That's a that's a widely held view, but there is still um, a, a local sector within Hong Kong. It's small, but there are filmmakers who flout the mainland China co-production route, you know, model, and work just in Hong Kong, make low-budget films primarily for the Hong Kong audience and tell, you know, local Hong Kong stories, um, socially relevant stories. Those films are still being made. Um, but the, just the production uh, levels have, dr have declined drastically um, this century. So, like I said, whereas in the in the late in the early 90s they were making 300 films, now they're making about 50. Oh, wow! Uh, and most of those, over half of those, are co-productions with mainland China. Mm. So that leaves very few lo purely locally produced films. Um, but the local sector is interesting um, because that's where the new talent is emerging as well. The new filmmakers, the new actors, they're not getting the exposure of the big co-produced blockbusters, but at least they're, you know, at least it's surviving, it's intact. The other thing, just briefly to mention in relation to this is that Cantonese is the dialect that's spoken in Hong Kong. And Mandarin is the language that's spoken in mainland China. And when Hong Kong films are co-productions with mainland China, they're released in the mainland. They're filmed and released in the main in the mainland dialect in Mandarin. So critics are afraid that Cantonese language cinema, which is associated with Hong Kong, will be die. You know, will die out as well, and it will be replaced by. It would be mainlandized. It would be replaced by Mandarin. So there's a general fear that the cultural traditions of Hong Kong cinema and Hong Kong society are, are on the brink of disappearance. Huh. Um, Interesting. So um, somebody who wants to 
watched some of the classics of Hong Kong cinema, what what are some of the films that they should be looking at? Well, um, obviously, I guess everyone has to watch a Bruce Lee film. Yeah, uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so that's not a bad way to not a bad place to start if you're as a you know kind of introduction to this this uh, this film industry. Um, so. Fist of Fury from 1971 is considered a, a classic. That was uh, that was his second film as a big adult, you know, superstar. And he directed a film called Way of the Dragon, and I think that's possibly my favourite. That's a really uh, it's set in Italy in Rome, and uh, but that has some terrific sequences. He takes on Chuck Norris in that film. Uh, there's a very famous uh, kung fu fight sequence between him and Chuck Norris. <laughs> um, uh, Jackie Chan, I would say, Peace Story from 1985 was a sort of landmark film uh, yeah. for him and for the Hong Kong modern uh, action, you know, urban based action film. John Woo, um, I think, a better, better Tomorrow or The Killer. The Killer was a big success in the West as a kind of cult uh, uh, gunplay film. There's a film called Rouge by Stanley Kwan, which was a, a right. kind of art film that, again, was well received in, in America and in, in Europe. That's directed by Stanley Kwan. That's considered, you know, that's what, that always makes the top 10 best Hong Kong films have ever, ever made, you know, the, the list. Um, Chunking Express, probably, or Days of Being Wild uh, for Wong Kar Wai. Infernal Affairs, so coming into this century, was an important film um, because at, at that point, the uh, Hong Kong film industry and Hong Kong society had been hit by a number of setbacks. You know, there was a, a, a an Asian financial crisis, an economic recession at the end of the 90s. Um, SARS, the SARS virus had hit just before um, you know, oh, yeah. around, yeah, around the early 2000, 2003. Um, there was piracy, ram the rampant piracy that was affecting the Hong Kong film industry. Uh, a lot of the Hong Kong film talent had defected to Hollywood, as we mentioned earlier. So that left an impoverished uh, local industry. Um, there are a number of sort of calamities and the the films were not being successful, proving successful. They were being outperformed by Hollywood imports at the local box office, whereas that hadn't historically been the case. Normally, local audiences preferred Hong Kong films to Hollywood blockbusters. So that had changed. Infernal Affairs came along, and that was such a sensation that it it sort of augured the recovery and rejuvenation of the Hong Kong film industry. So it was sort of symbolically important, but it was also it's also a very good film of its kind, I think, as a kind of intriguing, intricate uh, crime thriller. Mm. Then there's films like Shaolin Soccer, uh, which was <coughs> Stephen Chow and starred Stephen Chow. Um, that became an international success as well, uh, and Kung Fu Hustle. And then I would say there's a director called Johnny Doe, and he he made some films. Uh, he's been around for a long time, but he, for his film company, um, Milk, it's called Milky Way Image, he's made a number of really, really fine crime thrillers. That's his special, specialism, I think. That's his, uh, the genre in which he's been able to innovate the most. And I would recommend those. So there's a film called the Election, uh, PTU, uh, Exiles, more recently, one called Drug War, which was a mainland China co-production, and that that had some um, that uh, had some kind of uh, exposure in the West to Western audiences. And I would just mention Anne Hoy as well, who's a, probably the most famous female director. I mean, it is quite a male-oriented film industry, male-dominated industry. Yeah. She's sustained a career since the late 70s. She's one of those first new wave Hong Kong directors. And she's still making important films, you know, the most uh, films that get a lot of critical attention. <coughs> and she's extremely versatile and she's still making very worthwhile um, 
uh, I, I would say, significant films about Hong Kongers and, and Chinese history. So there's a lot there if people want to go and search it out. You know. And you've written a number of books on uh, China cinema. You've written um, two book volumes for the Directory of World Cinema on China. Right. Any film? Yeah. You got a book on Wong Kar Wai. Um, and you've got one on film theory. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> yeah, that one that one doesn't really can confine itself to Hong Kong cinema. <laughs> so that right. is, that covers uh yeah <clears throat> film history from the early silent era from all, yeah. all over the world. Yeah, that's co written by my colleague Richard Rushton. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, really you, a kind of textbook. You seem to be an expert on all of this Hong Kong cinema. <laughs> I, I'm always I'm always uh, nervous about the word expert because <laughs> all the films that I ha you, know, you haven't seen and there are always new things to learn. So yeah, well, you're you're a very well versed fan. Let's say that. Okay, <laughs> okay I'll accept that. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, what, what which of those books are, are you most proud of? Oh, that's a really difficult question. Yeah. Because some of them are collaborations, and I'm proud of the people that I've. I'm. I, I, I don't know. If proud is the right word, but uh, you know, I'm. I'm happy with the people that I've been able to work with. Um, it does. When you when you write a monograph, something that you've written entirely by yourself over a, a number of years, that that's quite rewarding, you know. But uh, I really don't read. I don't look back at them very much. I'm always, you know, thinking about what what to do next. So yeah. I, I, I wouldn't really pick pick one out. I don't think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have your uh, sensuous cinema of Wong Kar Wai oh. uh, on my shelf. Oh, great! Okay. Thank you. Stack of books to read. So <laughs> I'm going to be getting to that next year. I, I can recommend a great book on Hong Kong cinema, uh, which influenced my book quite a bit. Um, it's by David Baldwell. It's called Planet Hong Kong, and uh, it's an extremely readable, accessible uh, overview of uh, the history really, since the inception of Hong Kong cinema. He re he uh, updated it in 2011, so it covers some you know the more recent. Uh, the original edition was published in 2000, so it, co it covers more recent developments in the film industry too. But it's a really great book if if people are encountering this. This uh, cinema for the first time. Uh, I would recommend that book highly. There are a number of very good books on Hong Kong cinema, but uh, that, that's one of my favorites at least. Well, Gary, I appreciate the time you've given to us and, and the Not at all, no. knowledge no. of this movement that is so uh, obscure to, I think, most of my listeners and myself. And uh, it's nice to see uh, somebody who's been in it and can you know, digest it for us so that we can learn from it and enjoy it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode with Dr. Bettinson, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the episode he made with me on the new Hollywood cinema. You'll find a link to that episode in the show notes, along with links to his books on the Asian cinema. Thank you for joining me on the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. You'll find show notes and more information about us at ministryofmotionpictures.org. What we do in life echoes in eternity.